Just Jazz continues on Radio 1, was with 3.5 FM, your favorite all news, all talk, or sports station. It's another beautiful Friday evening. Time to lay down your hair and have fun. Work hard, play hard. And it's still just jazz on Radio 1, 103.5 FM. Tonight, we have a very great man here in the studio in our interview segment. I'm going to let him introduce himself with his baritone voice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Brian, electric bassist. I play with a band called Inner City Jazz. We play something that other people like to call jazz, which I just simply find is... Um, creative, intuitive music. It happens on the spur of the moment most of the time. In the last couple of years, we've been playing a lot in VI and ECOE. Right now, we're performing every Wednesday at La Taverna, on 40th Balarabi Musa, behind 1004. And on Fridays, not a fixed Friday, but like one or two Fridays in the month, we play at the American Embassy uh, Consulate Recreation Center on Queens Drive. So you can check us out sometime. Okay, um, I want to find out more about who uh, Brian Electric business. Is that your real name? I'm curious. <laughs> mm. Well, it is real, okay. but, but it's not my only name. My name is actually Ibrahim Brian Cox. Are you Nigerian? Let me describe um, Brian. He's fair skinned, by spectacled, with dreadlocks. And, and gray hair, gray hair. <laughs> salt and pepper, I'll call it. <laughs> so, where are you from, Brian? I was actually born in the Caribbean. I was born in Grenada a long time ago. All right. I can't even remember how I was born, but it was long ago, that long. Mm -hmm. I've been in and out of Nigeria for the last 20 or so years. Before then, I've lived in, of course, in the Caribbean, then in Canada, and in Austria. A little short spells in London. I want to find out from you, what's the attraction? What pulled you to Nigeria? Some people would say I was mad. But that's probably not true. Like I just said, I've been living in Canada, living in, in Europe, playing music for Caucasians. All right. And you see them all the time. Then I was playing more danceable music, but you always see them dancing. And when you're on stage and you see people dancing and they're dancing outside the rhythm, it makes you realize that they don't understand actually what you're doing. So in search of wider understanding, I realized that Nigeria had the biggest population of black people anywhere in the world. So... I decided to come here and try my luck among them. Needless to say, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but you know, I heard about me a long time ago. <laughs> okay, the musical journey, how did it start? It didn't start in my mother's belly because I remember as a kid, they always used to laugh at me and say, you can't dance, you can't dance. <laughs> but as a teenager is when it, actually, when it actually started. You know, the area I was growing up in, a lot of my friends, they were like, Four bands just within easy reach, let's put it that way. You in know, your neighborhood? In my neighborhood. And so I used to have friends that I was in those bands. And I mean, then I, then I couldn't play an instrument. Though. But I would be just going there, all my friends would be just be watching them play and everything, watching some of them learn to play and then develop and become part of the band. But at that point, I didn't even think I'd be a musician. I was just in it for the hangout. But later on, when I was at like about maybe 15 or so, we moved back because that neighborhood I'm talking about is really actually where my grandmother lived. Okay. So when my own immediate nuclear family moved back to that general area, I made some new friends and, you know, school was on the summer vacation, summer break, and we were hanging out in one of those rehearsal rooms when the band took a break. And every, all my friends picked up an instrument and started playing, and we couldn't play anything. And so when they all got tired and left, I was alone in the rehearsal room and I picked up the bass guitar and started trying to learn a song that was on the record player. And so that's where it started, actually. So you never dropped the bass since then? <laughs> never. Yeah, I did. I actually did. I actually dropped the bass. When, when I moved from the Caribbean to Canada and I couldn't get into a band because I couldn't play the kind of music that they wanted to play. They were all into this funk and stuff. And um, I was coming from the Southern Caribbean, not even the Northern Caribbean. The Southern Caribbean, so all I knew was Calypso, basically, as in how to play. I mean, we, there we were trying to play different things, but we weren't sharp enough to realize that we weren't actually achieving what we set out to do. We were just still playing the same songs, just as Calypso. Uh -huh. So by the time I got into the professional scene in Canada, couldn't fit in. And so I dropped the guitar, I dropped it. It was under the bed, actually. It even got warped. 
drop the guitar, drop music too. Yeah, totally. All I was doing was listening to music. I would go to sleep at night. You know, in those old days, they had these um, multi-changer record players. They could put five albums on there. Okay, it drops. It has a way. Yeah. Like, there's a metal in the middle. Yes. <laughs> I had one of those. That's what, that was one of my first purchases after I bought my guitar and, and stuff and realized I couldn't play. The next thing I bought was the record player. I just liked hearing music, so I just put five albums on and lie down and I would fall asleep. I didn't realize that it would have a, a subliminal effect on me. All right. I, you know, and so after I had done that for some time, I now I've lent my guitar. I rented him the amplifier and lent him the guitar, right? And I went to collect the guitar from my friend's place. And on the way to the bus stop from his house, I passed in front of a building, and there was an, an elder man there that knew me from in Grenada. And when he saw me with the guitar, he now asked me, Brad, are you playing again? And I said, no, I just went to pick my guitar up. I lent it to Andre. And he said, ah, you should be playing again. I, I said, after all this time, he said, yeah, he said, because the economy is bad and people are being unemployed. And, um, but one thing you ought to observe is that people always have a little extra money for entertainment. So if you're in the entertainment business, chances are you will eat. And he said, come, look, me, you know me as a refrigeration um, engineer. And I said, yes, he said, but why? I'm not doing that anymore. I said, yeah, what are you doing? He says, I'm managing bands. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, uh, just step inside, step inside. And I walked into the building and it was a four-story building and in every room there was a band rehearsing. And then he said, I should go into one of the rooms and there's a band there without a bass player. I should just go and play bass with them. I went and I played bass for a couple of hours and then at the end of that session, the guy that was playing keyboard, who was also like me, not part of the band, now called me one side and said, um, the band that he's playing with, they need a bass player and they're doing auditions the following day that I should come. So I went to the audition, got there, there were some guys playing before me, then it became my turn and I went up, plugged in and started playing. And like one hour later, the drummer stopped the song we were playing and said to the rest of the guys, wait a minute, this guy came for an audition, but we are rehearsing with him. <laughs> Just realized that. <laughs> and so that's how I got back into playing, played with them for a while, then joined another band. This one was with my friends. Then I decided to go fully professional because the one of my friends was basically semi-professional. All right. I had just finished school, and so all the other guys in the band were working. I was the only one that didn't have a day job at that point. Okay. And so we worked. I remember we played six weeks in a row for the first time, and then we had another offer. And the guys, some of the guys said they were tired, that they couldn't do it. I didn't think anything of it, but friends of mine in the band, I mean, that we were friends from before. One of them and I went out, I think it was the Monday night, we went to one of the clubs where one of our friends were playing, and the guy said to me, Brian, why are you guys? You guys not working. And the other guy was closer to him, so he explained to him why we weren't working. And he just looked at me and he said, Brian, you're mad. He said, you're the only person in that band that does not have a day job. And this, you have an opportunity to, to earn, and they say they are tired. Huh. He just called the world a waiter, got a barrel, and a bit of paper and wrote a telephone number and address for me and said, call these people, go there tomorrow. They were listening bass players. I went there and got the job. So you left the other band? Yes. <laughs> Actually, the friend that was with me was a little bit older than me. Right. So I first now asked him what he thought and he said, my friend, go and do the audition. I don't know whether he thought I would feel I don't know. <laughs> I went and I got the job. Went on tour with them. The singer of the band was dating the woman that was leading that band. Band, okay. And she was his booking agent for his own band. Okay. But the, the singer of that band had been ill. Okay. So he now filled in for the guy. <laughs> when he was leaving after filling in, he now took me with him to his own band. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we went on tour all, all across Canada, got as far as Newfoundland. Okay. On the way back, he fired the whole band because actually the truth of the matter is he couldn't sing. Hmm. So we would be on stage and we'd be doing all these tricks and we'd be laughing at the back. <laughs> so one, one night when he turned around and saw all of us laughing, he fired the whole band. <laughs> so again, I got back to Toronto and I went to see my friend who was working in a booking agency. And he got him, he got him there and he said, ah, you guys back. And I said, yes, so the guy sacked the whole band. He said, ah, he sack all of you. So you don't, <laughs> that means you don't, you don't have a job. I said, no, I don't have a job. He said, ah, this guy is looking for a bass player. I'll give him your number. The next day, the guy came to my house. It was John Ellison. I don't know whether you know this old song. I don't need a whole lot of money. Oh, yeah. I don't need a big fine car. Uh -huh. It was the guy that wrote that song. Came, and he now said I should play something for him. I played for him, and the next day we went on the road. So, because his bass player was leaving. He had not yet left, so the next the bass player was leaving. So I went on the road with them. I would do rehearsals with them in the day, and the guy would play in the night. The guy went on for like two weeks. Then the guy left. Okay, let's look at your current band now. 
um, do you have a band, a regular band? Yeah, yeah. So what's your band called? Inner City Jazz and Brian. Okay, Inner City Jazz and Brian. Yeah. Is it a quartet or...? It's a trio. It's, um, I play with a keyboard, drummer and myself. I get scared of trios. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you one thing, the, the tightest band ever, three-piece band, you know, from Jimi Hendrix, uh, the experience, the police, and um, a lot of them, even... Um, Oscar Peterson. Uh, you know, but you said, you mentioned uh, Nat King Cole in the discussion yeah. before. And the truth is, I never ever thought of the fact that the trio is usually, so. In first of all, it's so popular, yeah. and then um, so tight. The reason why... I like playing with the trio, and especially in this formation, is because I don't want anybody getting in my way when I want to play. Okay. You know, because I do everything with the bass. I lead with the bass. With the bass. Okay. I play the melodies. You know, sometimes I play the chords and blah blah blah. So when I want to do my solo, I don't want any guitar player doing anything that would put me <laughs> encroach on my space. So it's kind of a little bit of ego, a little bit of selfishness, and just a little bit of reality too. It's been wonderful having you on Just Jazz. Thank you, thank you. It's nice being here, nice being here. Nice people, the crew, I like the crew, I like the crew. I like the crew. I, I, Very comfortable. I, I, I like your spirit too. <laughs> You've been listening to our guest on Just Jazz. He's, um, he's a bassist, Ibrahim Cox, but he grows by the name Brian Electric Bassist. Thanks for yeah, coming. That's me, thank you, and thank you. You're brighter than the sun that's in the day. You're brighter than the moon that's in night. Oh, girl, you know. You're beautiful as you are There ain't no sunshine without a rain My day without you ain't the same Oh girl, you know You're beautiful as you are Say